Easter continues. In fact, Easter's impact has not lessened in over 2,000 years. Today, we, as Jesus' first disciples did, we worship the risen Lord who comes among us, offering us his peace. Peace be with you. Lord Jesus, we praise you for your life and for your love, which continues to surround us and all your people this and every day. Praise you for your selflessness, which even yet continues to care more for us than we could ever deserve. Thank you for your patience too, a patience that waits and longs for us to come to you and to find in you the freedom, forgiveness and fullness of life we all need. When, Lord, we plough on, on our own, without thinking of what you would say or do, when we disregard the example you have set us, then draw us back, we pray, back to you and gently tilt our faces to look into yours. And may we see there a love without limit that waits to dust us down and to set us off through life again. A love that goes before us and behind us and that surrounds us with peace and protection. Grant us, Lord Jesus, the courage and the wisdom to let you lead us and help us to follow, amazed at all you still do for us and ready to stay by your side through all eternity. These things we ask in your name, Lord, who taught your friends when they pray to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen.
While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled as written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written, The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. If you were here last week or if you caught the service online, then you'll know how I feel about poor Thomas, one of Jesus' disciples who's ended up with the title Doubter because he needed to see the risen Lord for himself. Unless I see the scars of the nails in his hands and put my fingers on those scars and my hand in his side, I will not believe. That's what Thomas had said when his friends told them that they had seen Jesus. And generations ever since have labelled Thomas the doubter as if none of the rest of Jesus' friends ever doubted Jesus was alive. The truth is, they all did. They all had trouble grasping what Jesus had done. And the proof of that lies in the words that we've just heard from St Luke's Gospel, where when Jesus appears, those friends of his are petrified. They think they're seeing a ghost. These are not people who see Jesus and immediately say, Great Lord, you're alive. These are people who don't know what to think and who are wondering what in the world is going on. And their fear is so obvious, so palpable, that Jesus has to prompt them. Look, he says, look, see my hands and my feet. It really is me. But his friends are still scared and still unsure. So he, he goes on, go on, touch me, feel me, I'm real. And Jesus holds out his hands for them to inspect. But even then, Jesus' followers can't believe what they think they're seeing. And in my head, at least, they shrink back further from Jesus, wishing that the wall would swallow them up. So Jesus tries again. Do you have anything to eat, he says, and someone is brave enough to go and fetch Jesus some leftover fish, which he eats in front of them all. But there's still no reaction. Jesus' friends have seen him with their own eyes. They've had the chance to touch him. They've heard his voice. They have smelled the fish he ate and they have watched as he ate, as he tasted. But still, they're not at all sure what's going on. Is it Jesus or? Then Jesus gives them some food, not physical food, but some food for thought. You're seeing me, you're hearing me, you can touch me and you've witnessed me eating. Let me help you pull all of these things together so that you can make sense of what's happened and of what I've done. And Jesus shares with this room full of confused and frightened individuals insights from the scriptures which point to how God's messenger would suffer and die and then after three days rise again. And then Jesus goes on to talk of something that is yet to happen, namely the preaching of the gospel to all nations. And you, Jesus adds, you are witnesses to these momentous events. A pause from Jesus to let that sink in. 
Was Jesus trusting these bruised and battered and broken friends of his to work with him in transforming the whole of this world and the lives of every person in it? He was. Jesus wanted these witnesses to witness. He wanted them to talk of what they'd seen and heard and felt and experienced. The disciples, that confused and petrified group of followers, were to go out into all the world and to start talking about the day the impossible became a reality. And that incredible and important task is a task that every Jesus follower has inherited. Us too. We are to talk of the risen Christ. But how on earth are we expected to do that even when we haven't had the chance physically to see and hear and touch Jesus, when we haven't physically met him? That's where Jesus' response to Thomas comes in. How blessed are those who don't see me, Jesus had said to Thomas and yet still believe. There is more to believing than simply seeing. Or is there? Let's come back to that. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one, and ask that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. The words that we've just heard were written by the same person who wrote our earlier reading. Both of them are from the pen of Luke. The second one, however, takes place quite a bit on from Easter, after Jesus' friends have been filled by the Holy Spirit, and after, too, they had found the courage to go and start doing the witnessing Jesus had told them needed to be done. In the reading, we heard Peter in full flow, talking about Jesus and his life and death and resurrection. 
But what was it that had prompted Peter's speech? Well, Peter and John had been making their way to the temple to pray. By the entrance, they'd met a man sitting begging. He'd been lame from birth and he couldn't walk. The man had asked Peter and John for money, and Peter told him, money is something we don't have, but what we can do is this. And Peter had said, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, walk. Then he held out his hand to the man, and the man had taken it, got to his feet, and walked. More than that, the man then went with Peter and John into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Which is why, when we picked up the story a moment ago, people were staring at Peter. How had he done that? How had Peter got the man walking? And Peter's answer was, it wasn't me, it was Jesus. The same Jesus, Peter said rather pointedly, the same Jesus many of you disowned and had crucified. But it's not too late. You have seen with your own eyes how this man you've known for years has been healed in Jesus' name. Believe and let Jesus heal you too of your sins. Let him turn you around so that you can experience and enjoy times of refreshing through him. See and believe. But what had they seen? They'd seen a hand held out to a man who needed that hand. They'd seen the miraculous, a lame man walking. These things, Peter is saying, show that Jesus is Lord. As do all the things the crowd had heard that day. The whooping of the man as he danced into the temple. The in Jesus' name walk from Peter's lips. And of course, Peter's speech. These things too bore witness to Jesus being Lord. And what Peter then tells his fellow Israelites is what Jesus had told Peter and all the others when they were hiding away in that locked room. He says to the crowd, open your eyes, open your ears, reach out your hand and you will taste and see how good God is. The actions, the sights and the sounds, the whole experience of faith which Peter offers people is not limited to words alone. Peter is not standing in the temple arguing his point and hoping that that's enough. He is showing what faith in Jesus actually does. He's letting people see and taste as well as hear what Jesus can do because he wants people to feel and to know and to experience for themselves the reality of God in Christ who is with them because that's what witnesses do. So how do we fare in the witness stakes? I suspect we are heavy on words and on the theory of what faith is. But light on helping people to sense and to experience the reality of what a living God who is right here, right now, can do. Witnessing to the gospel, though, is not about persuading people through words to make a decision for or against God. Faith is about helping people to meet Jesus, the risen Lord. It's about enabling people to see Jesus. It's about encouraging people to hear Jesus and to feel his touch and doing that in such a way that everyone is able to sense Jesus in and with their hearts, minds, spirits and souls and not just their heads. But to be able to do that, we ourselves need to be open to seeing and hearing and to being touched by the living Lord who is closer to us than our own breath. We need to let the faith we have move from our head to our hearts, to the very core of our being. And then, like Peter, 
we will be true witnesses of the living, transformative Lord, preaching as much without words as with. Breathe on us, breath of God, fill us with life anew, that we may love the way you love and do what you would do. Amen. Lord Jesus, you wait to be met in words and in silence, as well as in what we see and hear and touch and smell and taste. Help us not to limit you. Instead, help us to hear your voice in music and poetry, in song and in the sound of rivers, seas and birdsong, as well as in the bleating of lambs and in the gurgling of infants. Open all our senses to engage with you through the arts, through to the beauty of the natural world. Help us to search out those thin places where somehow, for some reason, we feel you close and know you are there. Maybe look for you in other people too and find you in unexpected smiles, in just the right words at the right time and in the touch of loved ones. And meeting you everywhere, show us how to live wholeheartedly with our hand firmly in yours, witnessing to your love and your presence through all we do and say.
and through the way we are. We bring you our prayers for others. Come afresh, Lord Jesus, to a world where, in the name of religion, people fight and abuse and murder. Inspire us to be the peacemakers you call us to be in our homes, in our communities, as well as in the world at large. And teach us, we pray, to live as you did, with respect for all and hatred for none. Come afresh to places where violence rages and people suffer. Come to where bombs and rockets fall, and the elderly and the very young are caught up in the middle. Help us, Lord, to speak up and to speak out for peace. Come afresh, Lord Jesus, to heal the sick. We place in your hands those who are ill, those who are recovering from surgery, and those for whom there is no earthly cure. Be their strength for this and every day. And comfort, we pray, those who mourn. Let the pain point to the love no one can erase, and fill them with the hope of love that never dies. All these things, Lord Jesus, we ask in your name, the one who meets us all and who deserves all glory and praise this day and always. Amen. Mm -hmm.